now for the last hour and a half straight. And so um, thank you so much for, for coming out. You know, I, I hope that tonight, this talk, I, I want to make your lives richer by the information in this talk. And I have some fundamental uh, objectives that I want to accomplish. First of all, I want you to pursue, I want you to, to understand the value of pursuing a lifestyle of health rather than just a reduction in pain. Okay, we all know that, and scientists and physicians, anybody that practices health care of any kind will tell you that just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean you're completely healthy. Would, would anybody agree with that? Okay, yeah. Um, God, who was it? Uh, oh, today I, I saw this patient, um, and she said, you know, I was just fine until May 1st. I was just fine. And all of a sudden, my arm started going numb. Well, do you think that just started <laughs> May 1st? Now, that had been going on for probably a decade at least, okay? So just because you don't have symptoms doesn't mean you're healthy. <laughs> the second thing is, is... I, I want you to understand the difference between crisis care and health care. There is a big difference between the two, and crisis care is not health care. Now, God forbid you need crisis care. That's okay. I mean, that's, that's what it's there for. But crisis care is not the same as health care. The third thing is I, I want you to take this information so you can be more intelligent about the way you make your health care decisions. I mean, if something happens to me, and I hope it doesn't, but you can go on and take this information and for the rest of your life, make better decisions regarding health for both you and your families. And the fourth thing is I want you to take this information and be able to talk to others and teach others about it. You know, I, I see my um, purpose in life is, is, is not to just entertain myself, okay? Is to, is to enrich and, and enhance and, and increase the value of other people. And so I don't do these, I don't do these talks because uh, I want a bigger house or a better car or I want to eat more expensive ice cream, okay? <laughs> I, I do these talks because I, I want to communicate truth and enhance the value of your life so you guys can make better health decisions. So the talk tonight we're going to do is called the safety pin cycle. And um, you're probably wondering what that is. Well, um, we have a built, built in safety pin and it's our own care and, and God given rescue mechanism. And every person that, that takes care of people is a primary <coughs> health care provider with the intention of expressing health and, and, and healing in their bodies rather than just treating symptoms knows this. They understand this. They understand the critical importance of the um, afferent and efferent pathways of the nervous system. Come on in, Joyce. Sorry. It's okay. Um, which I will explain to you in just a minute. So this law that I'm talking about is not privy to chiropractors. It's not just some, it's not an opinion or a chiropractic philosophy. And every now and then, you're going to hear people, you, and I know you've heard this, you, you hear people say, well, you know, I, I just don't believe in chiropractic. Oh, well, yeah. well, I know you've heard that. And, and that's okay for people, people to say that, but that's like saying, I don't believe in paint or glass. Well, you not, you may not, like glass, you may not, you may prefer wallpaper to paint. You may prefer something else to glass, but that doesn't mean you can deny its existence. The efferent and the afferent and efferent pathway work, whether you believe in it or not. That's like getting up and saying, you know, I don't believe in gravity. Well, <laughs> it works whether you believe in it or not, you know? So we have here what, what we call the brain body diagram and so the effort pathway and the way that you can remember the, the difference between these two and and a, another friend of mine helped me to to, to, to uh, remember this better think of the efferent pathway as, as, as things bubbling out of the brain effervescing out of the brain to the body okay that's how I remember it so 
what happens is these pathways work all the time. And you have the efferent pathway is your brain sending messages to your body. The afferent pathway is your body sending messages to your brain, telling your brain what it's experiencing so your brain can adapt and then send messages back to the body. These are endless loops of communication that are in existence constantly, whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. Anyone who does not know this or respect this or understand the effort and effort pathways before implementing or administering a diagnosis, it's violating one of the fundamental laws of life. Now, how important is the nerve supply from the brain to the body? We're going to talk about three scenarios here, okay? Bad scenario number one, guy's getting ready to get his head cut off by the guillotine. So what happens when somebody's head is cut off? I mean, I got the answer right here in case you don't know, okay? They die instantly, okay? Why do they die instantly? <laughs> no, blood flows cut off to their brain. The it, brain keeps processing for a few seconds. The brain, the energy from the brain, the body has to receive electrical energy from the brain. The blood flow actually comes from the heart, okay? But the, the, the body has to have the electrical energy from the brain to function. So when that energy is severed, body dies instantly, okay? So let's, let's look at bad scenario number two. It's a partial severing of the nerve supply. And here we have Christopher Reeve, okay? You know about him and he had the bad horse injury, all right? So here's we had a partial, much of the nerve supply was cut off, but not all of it. So he could not function from his neck down, but from his neck up he could, okay? So that's a partial severing of the nerve supply from the brain to the body. Now let's look at bad um, scenario number three. Sublux in it, subluxations interfering with the full nerve supply from the brain to the body. So now we have, um, we have not a major interference, but we have interference from the brain to the rest of the body. This is called a subluxation. Just a minor subluxation can cut off 60% of nerve flow to an organ or a muscle. And chiropractors are trained to correct subluxations. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I'm gonna say this, 20% of your nerve supply is pain related. 80% is function related okay so tell me what that means what anybody can anybody here tell me how that plays out in health your body is giving 80 percent of the messages just to function and that's 20 percent because hey there's pain let's do something about it. right so what if you have your your functional messages being um interfered with but not your pain messages what do you have then start feeling like you're sick in other ways that you think are organs or, or, or muscles or something else, but it's really just nerves. Yeah, that, that, that could certainly be a scenario. Or how about just you just start feeling one of your arms or one of your legs just is, starts getting a little weaker than the other one. You know I mean? Pain, you just feel weakness, okay? That's function. Weakness is function, okay? And so a subluxation can cause pain, and or dysfunction in the body. Now, the brain is constantly doing its best. It makes endless adaptations and observations in the body to maintain as much health as we can. There's no evidence that a healthy brain can create a sick body. There's no evidence of that at all. And even if you don't exercise, and even if you eat junk food constantly, and I know that probably describes about 50% of all the people who live in this country, okay? The brain is still going to do the best that it can to give you one more breath. It'll try and take that junk food and make as much, um, uh, uh, as good a tissue as it's able to, um, uh, to keep you alive a little bit longer, okay? Now, let me give you some examples. Let me give you one example. This happened about... 
four or five years ago, and I don't know if you guys heard this or not, but there is a, a girl in England, a 16-year-old girl who just collapsed and and was was uh, uh, literally dying, not not doing well. So they rushed her to the hospital, and the, the physicians there couldn't find anything wrong with her. I mean, they were, they were, we don't know why this girl is not functioning. So they started questioning her mother, and her mother, finally, it, her mother it got out that she, the only thing she had eaten since she was two years old was chicken nuggets. That was it. That was her 100% of her diet. Chicken nuggets. Okay? Now, how, how many you believe that you're, you could exist and be healthy on chicken nuggets? <laughs> Okay. Sometimes. You survive. Sure yeah, you yeah. survive. That's right. You can it's survive. okay if you make them with coconut flour, yeah. and coconut flour <laughs> and then fry them in coconut oil. It maybe. Maybe may, may a little better. Okay. Yeah. If that's twenty percent of your diet and not a hundred percent of your diet, you know, there's room for twenty percent for fun. So chicken yeah. has to be in the fun side. Right, right, right. So that's just occasionally you right. can it's you can live off right. of that. But but. That's an example of a body, you know, that girl's body did everything it could to keep it functioning for as long as it could on chicken nuggets, which is about 50% chemicals, okay, until it couldn't do it anymore. And then, and, and I, I would imagine she's probably heavy eating a different diet now, okay? <laughs> Hopefully she is. So, you know, I'm pretty in awe of the central nervous system and central nervous system starts with two cells which divide exponent exponentially and then they form this um they, they start forming what's, what becomes the brain and out of the brain becomes a spinal cord is formed the first cells are, are gray matter of the brain and then off of that everything else grows the autonomic nervous system and so the brain actually is the first thing that's formed the central nervous system controls and coordinates the entire development of the baby and then when we're born it, it controls and the the, the uh, all of our functions so the body tries to protect things so we have ribs that protect our vital organs okay but you think it's any coincidence that the brain and spinal cord are encased in bone okay no coincidence since that's the most important system of our body. And by the way, by weight, bone is nine times stronger than steel. Okay? Now, if you look at what happens in the body, in, in, the, in the spine. Now, the spine is protected in bone. You have 24 movable segments here. 30, uh, three pairs of spinal nerves that come out of here. The problem is, when we have a movable spine... Those spinal vertebra can get out of place and put pressure on the nervous system, and that's called a subluxation. That's the problem with this system, is that we have to have a system of protection, but we also have to be able to move. So the subluxation has been described in lots of different ways, and, and we'll just go through this pretty fast. Um, a, one way is a dysfunctional movement of a joint irritating a nerve, so sort of a hard bone on a soft nerve. I think it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's an easy way to describe a subluxation. Um, another way that subluxations have been described in the, in the medical literature is um, an in inflammation process where the ligaments and discs get inflamed, the tissues get inflamed, and that puts pressure on the nervous system, on the, on the nerves. I think that might be a little bit more accurate um, explanation than the number one and then there's number three outright compression of a disc well you can actually see this at times on an MRI and that's why we do MRIs because we want to find out if that's happening and number four is a little bit more esoteric we know that when bone gets compressed and when ligaments get compressed it creates an electromagnetic field around that area that's different from normal. So the fourth explanation of a subluxation is electromagnetic charge from an inflammatory response creating tissue changes which emit alteration in tone and electrical field. 
Now that's a little bit more that's a little bit more esoteric, but it actually might be a little bit more scientific, certainly probably more scientific than number one. Okay. So the science however you describe a subluxation, the scientific evidence proves that when you have it, um, you don't work as well. And when you get adjusted, you work better, basically. So there's there's three ways to look at chiropractic. Number one is we already talked about this. I just don't believe in chiropractic. So when you hear somebody say that, say, well, do you believe in gravity? You know, um, let's find out whether they believe in that. Chiropractic is only good for pain relief. There's a lot of people who are at this point right here. But there's number three. This chiropractic really enhances the way my body works and thus the expression of life and organ function. Now, um, chiropractic is not designed to make you instantaneously feel better. That happens sometimes. And I like it when that happens. Patients love it when that happens. But it's designed to make you instantaneously heal better. There's a difference between the two. This is pain. This is function. Okay? Now, when I get sick, or when I don't feel good, first person I go to is right there, Dr. Adam. He's a chiropractor and he adjusts me. And I've had him actually come over to my house at times. When I get sick, the first thing I do is get adjusted because sickness is more of a matter of function than anything else. And so, I, I, do I believe in taking supplements? Yeah, I believe in it. And I, I have supplements that work pretty well, you know, for, for people that are sick. When I get sick, I want to get adjusted first. That has the most powerful effect on my body of anything else. So, um, if you look at this loop between the brain and the body, you think that messages should travel at 100%. Probably, yeah. right? Yeah. So, do you think a liver needs 100% nerve supply to work right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... There are, the liver has, what, 400 functions? Do you remember? No. Okay, lots of functions, hundreds of functions, okay? The liver, the liver detoxifies, it, it makes transferrin, which, which hauls iron around the body and, and puts it into your cells. It does all kinds of things. Can you tell if you have a subluxation to your liver? No, you don't feel it. You don't feel it. You know, you know nobody's ever come into my office and said, you know, I think I got a subluxation in my liver. Would you check that out? No one's ever said that, ever, you know, in 36 years of practice. Never happened, okay? But we need 100% to our liver. Do you think a heart requires 100% nerve interference or 100% nerve flow? Of course it does, to work right. Heart's one of the most well innervated organs in the body. I mean, it is well innervated and it responds very well to chiropractic. Keith Wasson, he was the guy that developed those video pictures you see up there when you come into my office. He he made an interesting analogy. He said that thinking chiropractic is only is it's just a, a pain relief mechanism is like robbing a bank and stealing only the pens. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even give away the pens anymore at banks. You know, they have them chained up. They want to make sure that those cheap pens, you don't take them with you, you know. And I bring my own pen. They work better. So, uh, uh, so and here's the... Here's the, the, the medical way of looking at it. So, got back pain? Okay. Let's inject you with enough cortisone or painkillers to kill enough nerve endings to falsely reduce the swelling so you don't realize there's a problem. So you go back to work and re-injure your disc even more. Does that make sense? Okay, it doesn't to me. Um, remember, some of, you, some of you are old enough to remember this. Remember back in the 60s, late 60s, remember when cortisone first came out? Anybody remember that? It's back in the 60s. It was like it was like the miracle drug in the 60s. It's like the antibiotic of the 60s, cortisone. It was a miracle drug. Everybody was using it. I mean, and it was it was being used a lot like antidepressants are being used now without understanding the long-term side effects. 
And what they did in the 60s, and, and I think Dick Butkus, that very famous football player, was a victim of this, is football players would injure their knees in a game. They'd come to the sidelines, they get shot up with cortisone. What happened when they got shot up with cortisone? It's felt good enough to go back to play. Yeah, yeah. Swelling goes down, pain goes down, send them back in. And what they found out was that that just because the swelling went down, the pain went away, didn't mean that the problem was gone. And these players were just ruining their knees. And they, they realized after a while they couldn't do that anymore. Okay, because because the problem was not being fixed. It was just the symptoms. And all the swelling and pain they were getting was normal. That's what's supposed to happen when you injure your knee. So this is crisis intervention. Now, I'm not saying this is never appropriate. I'm not standing up here and saying this i'm not saying i'm just saying it's not appropriate real often okay and a lot of people that i see get this it doesn't work very well so with chiropractic the process of getting better sometimes is a little slower than getting a shot but it's a whole lot more in tune with your body's need to feel safe i mean don't do you think that pain exists for a reason to let us know there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. To let us know there's a problem. So, do you think that your oil light exists for a reason in your car? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if the oil light went on, how many of you would stop your car immediately? Okay, I would. Now, when I was a teenager one time, I was driving my dad's car and the oil light went on, and I didn't stop. Because I didn't, I, I just... I was going, well, that's that's nice. The oil lights. I'm pretty soon I hear this ding, 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 and this boom. And that was the end of that. They pulled the car over the side of the road as in the middle of nowhere out in West Texas. And it was not a good day for our family. Yeah. No. And not a good day for me either. I'll tell you that. So when the oil light goes on, it's like pain in the body. You don't cover it up. Okay. You just don't cover up pain. Okay. We don't want to hide symptoms. So... Uh, again, research has shown that even a minor subluxation can shut down 60% of the nerve flow. And again, um, even if your liver is functioning only 40%, you may not realize that something is wrong. So um, an individual with a nervous system as free of interference as possible can fight things off because it's your, it's your, your spine is intimately associated with your immune system but children who are subluxated they don't feel any pain they don't children don't most children go don't you know say daddy i have a migraine headache they don't do that you know here's what children experience when they're subluxated chronic colds allergies food intolerances i've seen all of this in my office behavioral issues ear infections or chronic ear infections sore throats all of that stem from interference between the brain and the body when you clear that interference kids tend to get better okay now am i saying that kids should never ever take a drug no i'm not saying that i'm saying that chiropractic first drug second surgery last that's what i'm saying and I've seen every single one of those in my office. I've seen every single one of them get better with chiropractic care. In fact, um, I just had a girl, a little girl, four years old, brought into me a couple weeks ago. You know what her symptoms were? She didn't have headaches. She didn't have back pain. She didn't have neck pain. She had chronic constipation and, and uh, uncontrollable bladder. She just went to the bathroom all the time, went to bed at night. Those were her symptoms. That's where her mother brought her in for. She didn't bring her in for your typical, this girl didn't have leg pain or numbness in her arm or a lot of the things that, that, that we have or that adults have. That's what she had. Now, is, is it, it's taking some time to, to, to get this girl better. We figured out her constipation issue. She, she's doing pretty good there now. Now we're working on her bladder issue. But those were her symptoms. Um, there's an article in a, in a prominent neurobiology journal in 2014 that stated this regarding the nerves arising from the upper neck. And I have this article here in the office. It's one I covered on my radio show. It's that when you look at the upper neck, 
this area right here, okay, the nerve supply that comes out of there and the muscles that, it, that, that control that area, these nerves have a great influence over the cardiovascular and respiratory area. Stimulation of these areas can influence uh, heart function and breathing. And this area also, interest, also influences the entire autonomic nervous system to influence the whole health and biological balance. Just this part up here. Well, you, you might think so because the spinal cord exits the brain right here. And the first thing it encounters is this little bone called the atlas, which holds your head up. So if that atlas is subluxated, that can have a huge effect on the body, which is one of the reasons I check it every time somebody comes in. So this is one of the reasons why it's, it's difficult to understand how chiropractic works. Some people say you have to go back over and over for the rest of your life. Well, you don't if you don't want to. I mean, I don't lock, have locks on the door to keep people in here. So how often, I mean, when can you stop brushing your teeth? I mean, do we, we only brush our teeth when they hurt. <laughs> oh, my teeth hurt, man. I better get, to, better get the toothpaste out and brush my teeth. No. We don't, it's a little we, too late then. We, we brush it to prevent them from hurting, right? Yeah, that's right. It's too, a little too late then, okay? So, so, so the, the, the question is, is what, do we go to the chiropractor just when we hurt? No. In fact, tonight, as soon as we're done, Dr. Adam and I will adjust each other. Right now, I'm in no pain. I don't think you probably are either, are you? I'm good. Okay, so we're just going to just maintain each other just to make sure that, that we're, we're functioning as good as we can. So, you already spoke up, Tour de France riders, you already spoke up. don't get adjusted because their backs hurt. And believe me, um, the American team that won all those, all those years, um, they were all adjusted. After every day, they were adjusted and lasered. Um, and they know that because it enhances their performance. Do you know that uh, racehorses get adjusted before? Yeah, even racehorses get adjusted. Do racehorses have migraine headaches? Not that I know of, okay? But they, they run better. They function better. They run faster when they're adjusted. And, and, and I have a friend up in Columbus who adjusts bulls. He adjusts prize bulls. Gets paid very well to do it. You know why? Because the bulls produce about 10 to 20 percent more semen when they're adjusted, when they're in adjustment. Wow. Okay? Do the bulls have headaches or do they have, you know, hoof pain? Maybe they have some hoof pain or whatever, you know, shoulder pain or, but no, but they get adjusted because they're better bulls when they're adjusted, okay? They function better. Do you have a question? Oh, she probably just wanted to tell you she actually got to see a horse get adjusted not that horses, too long ago. And actually, horses actually some sometimes they actually can have migraines. Really? Did they tell you that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So, as doctors at chiropractic, we don't adjust people just get out of pain. We adjust them. Just because because it's the right thing to do. For example, we drink more water because it's the right thing to do. That's why you get Kangen water because it's the right thing to drink. Okay, we take supplements because it's the right thing to do. So we do because we we do these things because it enhances our expression of life. So my goal in in this office not just to get you out of pain, but it's to help teach you to take better care of yourself. So teach you that the brain body process requires a hundred percent afferent afferent pathway. And again, it's not a theory, it's not an opinion, it's a scientific fact. So all I ask you to do if you're a patient of mine is come in, make your appointments, come on time, let me adjust you and, and let miracles happen. Um, and one of the things that 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 medical science is showing us, that the research is showing us, is this issue of um, repetitive trauma. In other words, you know, if, if your balance is off, okay, and you, and you walk over and over and over again, eventually that's going to affect the disc. And that's why discs 
wear out. That's why discs degenerate. That's one of the things they do. So um, that's all I have for today. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Do you think the chiropractic care, your holistic healing methods could help autism because of autism? Yes, but okay. it wouldn't be just chiropractic. Yeah, my survive. daughter right here, she has autism. She sees a chiropractor. It does help. Does it? Yeah, my, yes. my children are autistic, and when I was able to be in with them, um, chiropractic was one of the ways that I helped mm -hmm. with their behavior yeah. issues. It's not with every, it does not help with everything, but it helps right. with the behavior issues quite a bit. Right, it helps with a lot of things. Uh, we do a lot sleep. of other stuff, yeah. too, but... Yeah. Chiropractic does a lot of good. There you go. There's your answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, get it from son, I think my stepdaughter's son is, is autistic. They, they haven't diagnosed it as that yet, but he has constipation and kind of, you know, just just retarded, you know, development, you know, slow development, underdevelopment. I the would constipation definitely... does go quite a lot with um, yep. chronic constipation, chronic um Digestive issues, a lot of food allergies goes mm -hmm. hand in hand with autism. It really does. One thing I will definitely tell you: increase the good fats. Lots of coconut oil, avocados. Yeah. Great for the brain health. Yeah, and the healthier and flaxseed supplements help my kids a lot too. Not the fish oil, but the flaxseed because yeah, it has all the omega threes, sixes, and nines. So we we actually take a fish oil supplement. So. I'd have you guys teach a class on autism. I can. I, can. I actually, I actually treated and diagnosed autism in Michigan. I don't have my licensure here, but I could. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, next next um, time I do this class, which is on uh, the third of July, we're going to talk about vaccination. It's going to be uh, it's going to be forty five, at least forty five minutes, maybe a little longer than that. We're going to go into autism a lot then. And we're going to look at what is the most current research showing about vaccination and what's in vaccination and what that does to kids. So that's that's first time I've ever done that talk. Um, it'll be brand new. So that's something that you may want to be here for and you may may not want to miss. And thank thanks for your input on autism. I appreciate that. Um, I, that's that's enough. I won't say any more about it. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. So it's it's a little after seven. Uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And anybody that was watching on Facebook Live, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you all soon. Okay.